Like last week, I'm going to invite everyone to stand for the reading of God's Word. So if you'll join me at this time, we're going to read the Great Commission, which if you missed last week, this is our text for the next several weeks. We are looking to these words, and we stand in reverence because these are the words of Christ that he's given to his church. They're not my words. They are his, and this is our mission. So let's read it together as one. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You may be seated. Last week we began this and we looked at that text. And if you remember, Jesus is in Galilee as he is saying these words. He's offering the marching orders to his disciples and last week we talked about it, how contextually it's probably three to four weeks after his resurrection. He's in Galilee before he makes the seven-day journey to come back to the Mount of Olives where he will ascend to the right hand of the Father. But there on Galilee, last week we saw the 11 disciples are there, plus others. The disciples are worshiping, others are doubting, and Jesus says, don't doubt me. Instead, he said, all authority. And heaven and on earth has been given to me. And we talked about that last week, how the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, how he is ultimately the prophesied Messiah that Daniel had spoken of in chapter 7 of his prophecy. And Jesus said that he's come and he now has all authority. And we talked about that last week. Jesus has authority over all of creation for two reasons. One is by virtue of creation, because Colossians 1 tells us all things were made by him, through him, and for him. Jesus Christ is our creator, but then we're also told that Jesus has all authority because he's our redeemer. Jesus Christ has purchased us through his blood, and Revelation 1.18 tells us now he has the keys to death in Hades. So Jesus speaks to his disciples while some are doubting, they are worshiping, and he says, I have all authority. And because he has all authority as our resurrected Lord and Savior, he tells his disciples as he tells us today, go therefore. And if you were here last week, we looked at that word, go. And that word go, if you studied it last week, if you were with us, you remember we talked about how that really means when you have gone, as you're getting out of here. Jesus says worship services can't last forever, guys. You're worshiping now, but eventually you got to get out of here. And when you go, he said, do something very specific. And what is it? It's our text for today. Go, therefore, and make disciples. He says, go and make disciples disciples. It's interesting in this great commission, these two verses, there's three different participles. There's going, there's teaching and baptizing. We'll talk about those in the upcoming weeks. But there's one direct imperative that really is the central focus of it all, and it's to make disciples. Jesus says, go and make disciples. Well, then what on earth is a disciple? If you study historically what that means for, to, for there to be a disciple, a disciple was someone who attached themselves to a teacher. They would follow their teacher. They would learn from their teacher. They would actually act like their teacher and duplicate their behavior and their words. In fact, there's ancient tradition that it would be an honor to walk so closely to your teacher, your rabbi, that as they would kick up the dust and the dust would come on you as a follower, as a disciple, that was a badge of honor. Because what you were doing really metaphorically is you were actually following them so closely that that dust started to carry on you that you started to show people who you were following. And Jesus says, this is what a disciple is. He follows me, and he learns from me, and he does what I say. And Jesus was in the disciple-making business. If you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, in the third chapter, Jesus has his inauguration moment, and that's his baptism. Where Jesus is publicly baptized, we see the triune God come together in this holy moment where the Father speaks, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and Jesus is then sent out into public ministry in Matthew chapter 3. 
In Matthew chapter 4, he's tested after the inauguration. He goes and takes on Satan at the Mount of Temptation. But after he conquered Satan and all that he threw at him in that moment, Jesus went, and what did he go do first? He made disciples. He called some fishermen, and he told them they're now going to be fishers of men. He said, I'm going to show you what to do. And for the next few years, these men, these disciples, followed Jesus. They were catching up that dust coming off of his sandals. They were following him. They were learning from him. They spent those years with him. But now the discipler, Jesus, speaks to his disciples in Matthew 28. And he says, now it's your turn to go make disciples. He said, you go do exactly what I've already done for you. And what Jesus is saying in this text is our first point today. Jesus wants more followers. He doesn't want fans. Jesus wants followers, not fans. What do I mean by that? Jesus' ministry was really marked by two different groups. There were followers and there were fans. Because Jesus had some who were disciples and they did follow him closely, but he also had a large fan base. When Jesus started his ministry, he would begin to heal. And when you heal and you give something to people, they will come and see you. So he had multitudes come all the time. Then Jesus started preaching. And his words carried authority, Matthew told us last week. So Jesus would preach and people wanted to come and listen. And then Jesus would feed. You remember the feeding of the 5,000 where really there would have been fifteen to 20,000 people counting the women and the children. Jesus feeds them. And of course, if you're going to be fed, you will come. You will become a fan. And it comes to that climactic moment on that triumphant Sunday when Jesus descends from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. And you remember on that Palm Sunday how everybody is shouting, Hosanna to God in the highest. Jesus had a lot of fans but he didn't have a lot of followers. Because if you know the story, the same people who shout Hosanna are then starting to shout, crucify him in just a few days. And likewise, there were 15 to 20,000 people showing up saying, literally, feed me, Jesus, give me this food. But in Acts chapter one, when Jesus ascends and he goes back to the right hand of the Father and he says, go pray and wait for the Holy Spirit. You remember how many are in the upper room doing what he said? 120. 120 are there. He had tens of thousands follow him around, but 120 are left at the end in the upper room praying for the Holy Spirit. And why is that? It's because it's easy to be a fan. It's very difficult to be a follower. You see, fans are fickle. I know this because I lived in Houston for 12 years. And I lived in Houston, and I was there serving at a church. And when I got to Houston, the Houston Astros were not the Astros. They were the Lastros because they were in last all the time. They kept losing. They lost for years. It was really difficult times for the city of Houston. And I remember when I got there, I would go to the box office, and I would buy a $12 ticket right there at the gate and go in, and I could sit anywhere, anywhere. It did not matter. There was nobody there. There was probably a 1,000 people in there in a 20,000-seat ballpark. You could sit anywhere because fans are fickle. But then notice when the Astros started winning how things began to change. And in fact, I was there, and I jumped on that bandwagon very quickly because over the time I was in Houston, we went from being the Lastros to the World Series champions. And suddenly, those seats were full. And suddenly, prices went up, and they skyrocketed. Why? It's because everybody wants to be a fan. Everybody wants to latch themselves on to something great. Everybody wants to do something that will actually make them look good by association. You see, being a fan is very easy. Being a follower will actually cost you something. And that's why Jesus says he doesn't need any more fans. Because truthfully, in America, there's enough fans right now for Jesus. People that say, yeah, I'd love for him to be my Savior. I just don't want him to be my Lord. I don't really want any of that. That I'm okay with him on Sunday. I'm just not going to listen to him on Monday. I'll listen to a sermon because Jesus was wise, but I'm not going to apply it this week. 
that I will follow him when things are easy, but I will abandon him when things get hard. You see, Jesus doesn't need any more fans in his fan base. He says he wants more disciples. And Jesus gives us an invitation in this room right now. He tells every one of us that we have the same offer given to us that he gave to those 12. He's invited us to come alongside him and to attach ourselves to him. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus communicates this challenge. He says this. This is an invitation then, and it's an invitation now. He says in verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and he says, my burden is light. Jesus said, come to me if you're tired of doing life your way. Come to me if you're tired of just having your wheels spin and go nowhere. Come to me if you're tired of not finding the joy you're looking for. And he says, take my yoke. And what is a yoke? It was that wooden frame that you would put between two different animals. Most often, oxen. You would put two oxen together and put this yoke, and they would share it, and then they would share the load together. They would walk together in unison. And Jesus simply says, attach yourself to me. And he says, I will teach you. He says, learn from me. You see, Jesus wants you to be close to him, every single one of you. You might say, well, I don't know if he'd want to be close to me if he knew what I did. This is what makes Jesus amazing. He knows everything you've done and everything you ever will do. And he says, come to me. And he says, I want to teach you a few things. Let me help you carry the burdens of this world. He says, come to me. He wants a follower, not a fan. But I need to give you a warning today. And it's the second point. Discipleship will be costly. Discipleship is costly. He says, come to me and let me teach you a few lessons but he is also warning us that discipleship is costly. I like the way Billy Graham says it. Billy Graham says that salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything. Salvation is free. Discipleship costs everything. What does that mean? To be saved, it actually costs you nothing. Nothing. We're saved by grace through faith, not through works. So there's nothing I can do to go to heaven. There's nothing you can do either. Jesus did it all. Jesus lived the perfect life we're incapable of living. Then he died a death substitutionary for me and for you. And then he conquered the grave, something we cannot do to give us hope at receiving new life. And when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, there is this transaction that happens his righteousness is imputed onto you, and your sin is put onto him on that cross. And in that moment, salvation is given to you, not because of something you did, it's because of simply what Christ has already done. It requires simply your faith and your trust. You repent saying, God, I don't want to go this way, I want to go towards you, and I give you my life. But that's where it gets costly. Because you see, receiving salvation is free, but living for Christ will cost you everything. There's this part of that verse lots of times we don't like to acknowledge. It's Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. You see, we love the part about being saved. And we love the part about belief. The part we don't like is that word, Lord. We don't like that word. Because many of us in this room, we only want Jesus to be our Savior. We don't want him to be our Lord. Because Savior simply means, well, I don't want to go to hell. Who would? Nobody does. Sure, I'll believe in Jesus. And many people want him to be their Savior, but they don't want him to be Lord. Because what does Lord mean? Lord means, oh, by the way, he's in charge now. And everything he tells me to do, I will learn from him. I will walk with him. I will follow his example. I will submit to him and his desires for my life through this word. And many people 
think they're Christian, and I love you enough to tell you you're not if you've only made him Savior and not Lord. Because it's not enough simply to believe in him. We're told in James chapter 1 that even demons believe in Jesus, and they shudder. They're scared of him, but they won't make him Lord. And this is the hard place we find ourselves in many churches, is we're willing to accept a free gift, but we will not lay our lives at the altar. But Jesus says if you are going to follow him, it's going to cost you. You have to surrender your life to him. Just so you know, he said it and not me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, this is what Jesus says. If anyone would come after me, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, Jesus' invitation in Matthew 11 sounds really tempting. Okay, well, I'll come to him. He said he'll give me rest. But he said, by the way, While I'm giving your soul rest, you're going to have to carry a cross with you. He says, you're going to have to deny yourself. And what does that mean to deny yourself? It means you put God first now in your life. You say, whatever you want from me, Lord, I'm yours. I'll listen to your word. I'll remain soft in my heart towards you. I'll repent of my sin. That I will deny myself and put you first. And that issue of lordship becomes a hang-up for many of us. One such, such example in the Bible is Luke chapter 18. Anybody remember the story of the rich young ruler? And the rich young ruler who was a ruler in the synagogue, he comes to Jesus and he gives his big resume and he says how religious and elite he is, says all the positions he's acquired, all the classes he's taught, all the rules he's followed, all the positions of leadership he's re- attained. And then Jesus says, oh, it's gonna cost you one more thing. He says, you lack one thing. He said, sell everything and follow me. And you remember how the rich young ruler responded? We're told he was saddened. And why was he saddened? It was because he didn't want to let go of things. He didn't want to let go. He wanted to still rule over his own life while receiving the benefits of Jesus. And Jesus said, I don't negotiate. He said, if you're really going to follow me, you have to live open-handed with everything that you are and everything that you have and everything that you'll ever be. And the rich young ruler was in a tough place. And I wonder if some of you are in that same place right now, where you hear Jesus calling to you to come, but you won't come because you don't want to let go. And the reason you don't want to let go is because you think those things are somehow going to satisfy you. Which, can I tell you one of the ironies of that whole thing? There's so many people that won't surrender things to Christ, whether it be their relationships, their money, their future, their careers, their addiction. And those things that we hold on to, the things we don't want to let go of, usually are the very things that give us anxiety and pain. They usually are the things that bring us trouble over and over and over again, but we don't want to let go of them. And Jesus says, let go of it. Deny yourself. Follow me. And so many people won't follow because they want to hold on to the very things that are hurting them. The second irony of that position is this. Not only do we hold on to destructive things, the second irony is we think that if we let go of those things, that somehow our life will be ruined. But Jesus actually says it's the opposite. He says, by letting go of those things, it doesn't hurt you. He says, follow him because his life is better. The plan he has for you is actually better than your own plan you have for your life. And if you continue in that Luke chapter 9 passage in verse 24, this is what Jesus says. He says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow him. But then he says in verse 24, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he'll actually save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet he and loses or forfeits himself? Jesus says that if you let go of these things, you might think you are going to end your life. He says, actually, you're going to save it. And he's not just speaking eternally, because in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says the life he came to give us, yes, it's eternal life, but he said he came to give you life and life to the full. When you let go of things and you follow Christ, he gives you life eternal, but he gives you life right now. And that is where the paradox of discipleship comes in. Because following Christ leads to life, 
But following Christ requires us to crucify those things in our lives that he doesn't want there. And because of that tension, many people are caught in the middle, and Jesus just says, let go. Trust me that following me is worth it. In fact, there's a famous theologian, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German pastor, theologian. He was a great hero of the faith, stood up to Hitler and the Nazi regime, but he wrote a famous book called The Cost of Discipleship, a classic he wrote in the 1930s. And there's a quote I'm going to share with you today. This is what Bonhoeffer came to as a concluding statement along these lines. He said this, If we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions and partings will it demand? To answer this question, we shall have to go to him. For only he knows the answer, only Jesus Christ, who bids us follow him, knows the journey's end, but we do not know, or excuse me, but we do know that it will be a road of boundless mercy. And why? Bonhoeffer said, because discipleship means joy. And I love what Bonhoeffer said. He said, you might actually be right now in the middle not knowing what to do, and should I really go all in with Jesus Christ? He said, the only way you can really know is by going all in with Jesus Christ. He said, by going all in, that it requires faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, to please God. So by exercising that faith, saying, I surrender my life to your hand, Bonhoeffer says at the end, it leads to joy. And why does he know that? It's because he lived it. He laid down everything. If you don't know his story, he literally laid down his life for the cause of Christ. But he said it's joy. Because for him and for so many others, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that is discipleship. To say, I will let go of everything because it's worth it. And my question this morning is simple. Are you a fan or are you a follower? Which one are you? Make a decision. And don't confuse yourself to be one if you really are the other. Be honest. Are you really following Christ? Are you just around him because it's fun to be a part of the fan base? Jesus says, let go of these things. Surrender your life to him because it leads to joy. Discipleship is costly, but it leads to joy. But then finally, we'll land on this point for today. Just as discipleship is costly, I have to give you a warning. Disciple-making is also costly. It's costly. Being a disciple will cost you. Making disciples will likewise cost you. And how do I know that? It's because Jesus made disciples, and it cost him all the time. It cost him. I told you Jesus was a disciple maker. He made those disciples. He invested in their lives for those three years of public ministry. He walked with them and talked with them and taught them and loved them. But you think about what did that actually cost Jesus over time. I can tell you it cost Jesus emotional energy. It absolutely did. Because as Jesus was leading those dis disciples, they disappointed him. They would question him argue with him, misunderstand him. Jesus walked with his disciples and it cost him heartache. How do you feel, how do you think his heart felt when he saw Peter after he denied him three times? How do you feel his heart felt after he washed Judas's feet and then he betrayed him? How do you think he felt in John 6, 66, where we're told many disciples who thought they were disciples but really were not, how they just upped and left when it was no longer fun for them. It broke his heart to watch these things happen. It cost him emotional energy. It cost him heartache. But can I tell you this also? It cost him time. Jesus spent so much time with them. It was exhausting. He spent time with them everywhere he went. That's why sometimes he just had to get away from them because he couldn't get away from them. So at moments, he would go out to be restored by his father because Jesus spent so much time with his disciples that he went with them everywhere. He showed them what to do. They, he urged them to be faithful to God. And the reality is, if you want to make disciples, it's going to cost you in the same way. It's going to cost you emotional energy because people are going to let you down in this world. 
It will also cost you heartache because people will misunderstand you and betray you. But also, I can promise you this, it will cost you time. It takes time to make relationships. That's why relationships are hard. Relationships always take time. It made me think I was at Academy a few weeks ago buying some stuff for my kids for sports. And we were in there, and we had a basket full of junk and stuff we had to buy, and it was later after work, evening, needing to get home and get the kids in bed. And we're there, and all the stuff's there, and the, the cashier's doing the scans. He's getting everything bagged up. And I remember on that day, I was tired. It had been a long day. My kids are with me. They need to go to bed. And we're at Academy 30 minutes from our house. And I've got a basket full of junk, and I'm about to spend a lot of money. And I'm in the best mood, and then all this stuff. And then, bless his heart, this cashier just wanted to talk. He wanted to talk so badly. And I don't know if you've ever been there where you want to get out, but you're stuck. And he just kept talking. And I mean, he was moving at a sloth pace of scanning each individual thing and talking to me for a while between. Then he'd finally take something and scan. And I about lost it. And I, I had to bite my lip. Thankfully, I didn't say anything. And the fruit of the spirit of self-control came out at that moment. But I wanted to because what I wanted in that moment, I didn't want a relationship I wanted a transaction. That's what I wanted. I wanted a transaction. But can I tell you one reason why so often we are ineffective in evangelism is because we treat people like transactions. We want transactions, we don't want relationships. This happens so often for all of us, myself included, where we treat people like they're transactions. Turn or burn, make a decision. And if you don't make the right decision, I'm done. I tried everything I could. Do you think that's how Jesus did it? Do you think that's how he did it? They had one conversation with somebody, and it didn't go well, and he just gave up on them. If he did that, he'd have no disciples, because all those jokers made mistakes along the way. Sometimes we treat discipleship like it's a curriculum. Well, if I just get them in a six-week class, then I'm done. Wash my hands clean, because that's a transaction. They're now, quote, discipled. No, people are not transactions they're not transactions and that's why for you and i if we want to really make an impact in the kingdom of god we have to see people for who they are they're god's children and the one across the street from you that is aggravating you that you feel like you've tried everything to reach out to them jesus is saying you just got started for your kids that you're called to disciple and they are not responding the way that you hoped Jesus would say, yeah, I know how that goes. For your coworker that seems so out of bounds and nothing like you and doesn't have any love for God and you've written off, Jesus would say, no, this is actually harder than you realized. You see, people are not transactions, they are people. And if you want to win people for Jesus Christ, it means you have to count the cost in disciple-making. And for every single one of us in this room, if you really want to live on mission, what that means is you have to first crucify your own flesh because you will never be able to impact other people if you don't make room for them. But the good news is, even though disciple-making comes at a high cost, can I also tell you this? It comes at a high reward. It makes me think it to the scriptures when Eunice and Lois, mother and grandmother, how they discipled young Timothy. And Timothy learns about Christ through his mom and his grandma. How do you think they must have looked at him in those later years as they watched him become a young man of God? How do you think Paul felt when he watched Timothy grow up in the faith and then becomes a pastor of a prominent church as a young leader? Don't you think Paul had eyes of just gratitude and joy as he watched that young man? Makes me think how Jesus must have looked from heaven when he, Peter had just denied him three times, but weeks later, he's preaching at Pentecost, and he preaches the gospel, and 3,000 people are saved. Don't you think Jesus had a smile on his face in that moment? And the same way in my own life, when I've looked at the people that have drained me the most, but you've seen the life change years later, can I tell you it's always worth it. When you see a marriage healed, when you see an addiction broken, when you see a child grow up to marry a Christian spouse and have Christian children and build a lineage of faith, that's the reward that you can't put a price on. And because of that, that makes disciple-making costly but worth it. 
Because following Christ may cost you, it leads to joy. And making disciples will cost you, but likewise, it will lead to joy. But you will never find that joy until you count the cost. How do you view people on your go card? Are they transactions or are they people? Because Jesus says if we will look at them the way he looks at us, we can go and we can all make disciples.